You're watching live coverage of the NASA SpaceX Crew-5 mission as they return to Earth. Dragon Endurance departed the International Space Station at 11.20 p.m. Pacific last night with NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh, Josh Cassida, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. Currently, they're on their way to the targeted splashdown site off the coast of Tampa, Florida. My name is Kate Tice, and I'm the Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. And joining me today from NASA Communications is Leah Cheshire. Thanks, Kate. It's always great to be here. And of course, another exciting day bringing a crew back from the International Space Station. So upon departing the station, Dragon underwent a sequence of departure burns. Since then, the crew had a rest period and has since kicked off preparations for re-entry. Things are sounding pretty good so far. So in this next phase of the mission is when things really ramp up and happen pretty quickly. Dragon has a series of steps to complete before returning Crew 5 back to Earth. First, Dragon will maneuver to the correct attitude and jettison its trunk, which is the cylindrical, unpressurized part of the spacecraft. The trunk is currently connected to the aft or the bottom section of the Dragon capsule, where the heat shield is located. So in order to expose that heat shield and get the vehicle ready for atmospheric reentry, we'll jettison that trunk. And just a quick look right now inside Crew Dragon uh, with our Commander Nicole Mann on the left and pilot Josh Cassida on the right. Uh, after we jettison that trunk, we're, we're looking for that to come up uh, not too long from now. But from there, the spacecraft will use its forward thrusters to perform the deorbit burn, which will put Dragon on a trajectory to return to Earth. The burn will last just over 11 minutes once it starts, and it uses the Draco thrusters on Dragon. These are the four located on the forward bulkhead primarily, and it's executed at the apogee or the highest point of Dragon's current orbit around Earth. This will alter Dragon's path to ultimately line it up to re-enter Earth's atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Tampa, Florida. Uh, that's right, and we're actually looking at that trunk separation to happen in about three minutes. The orbit sequence start. And we've heard Dragon copy. Good calls from the core uh, here in Mission Control Hawthorne. That's the Mission Control room you see on your screen. To the crew, another good interior shot. Down in the bottom left-hand corner, that's Anna Kikina, the Roscosmos cosmonaut uh, that has flown on Crew 5. And then... We are also on the other side of the spacecraft. We didn't get a good look at him, but it's Koichi Wakata, the JAXA um, astronaut that has joined us as well. So again, good calls. We've heard good uh, confirmation of suit leak checks up until this point. As you can see, the astronauts are in their suits and seats after they had uh, some time to rest and relax over the past What's it been, 18-ish uh, hours <laughs> since they undocked yesterday? Yeah. Um, like everything that occurs on the International Space Station, everything is scheduled. It's choreographed, including that sleep period, that crew rest period, uh, where basically the crew got to clock uh, off duty and um, rest, relax, enjoy the view, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So at this point in time, um, like we mentioned, we are coming up to uh, the separation of the claw, which is the mechanism that holds that trunk, that unpressurized uh, section of the Dragon capsule onto the pressurized section. Um, so we're about a minute away from that claw separation and then trunk separation uh, will occur about in about a minute and a half. Um, so yeah, that trunk, like we said before, is the unpressurized section. That's where we can store cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space, um, and of course the astronauts are in the pressurized section, but that heat shield is located at the bottom of the pressurized section, so it's currently being covered up uh, by that trunk, so we'll separate the trunk to expose that heat shield. Another important thing to note is when we do claw separation, we're separating those umbilicals that connect the trunk to the pressurized section or the actual dragon capsule where the astronauts are. So the uh, solar cells that are wrapped around the trunk, those will, of course, be detached. And once we dispose of the trunk, dragon itself will be on internal battery power. Yeah. So pretty exciting. Um, all of this um, 
you know, as you mentioned, Leah, it's been 18 hours of progress. Um, but at this point in time, uh, to prepare for the upcoming events uh, right now, the Dragon spacecraft is doing a couple of things autonomously, meaning it's doing it on its own. Um, it's isolating the thermal control system fluid loops from the radiator. Uh, this system is what will help keep the internal temperature of Dragon uh, very comfortable for Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna during that reentry phase. Uh, Dragon is also initiating separation of the claw mechanism. Like I said, that's coming up uh, in about 10 seconds or so. Um, and that will terminate, like Leah just said, uh, that data, the power and the fluid connections between the capsule and the trunk. So we're standing by to listen for the call out um, for trunk separation. And I got one update that we are in the proper attitude for that trunk separation. So awesome. just one more of those checks that we were standing by to hear. Uh, again, we are just in a waiting game <laughs> until we have that uh, claw and trunk separation. But that nominal trunk jettison. All right, there's that call. Great news. Right on time. Dragon step. So as you can hear, that, like we mentioned, is the core calling out to the crew. They report that they copy because they're able to keep track of it on those crew displays that uh, we could see over their shoulders. So again, the claw uh, and trunk just separated. The claws where those umbilicals for power and telemetry um, are from the trunk and its solar arrays connect to the capsule. So now that they've disconnected, again, Draken is, is exclusively on battery power. And we just uh, additionally got that confirmation of successful trunk jettison as well coming right on time at about 5.06 p.m. Pacific. So with that trunk separation, telemetry is looking good. The nitrox system is primed uh, for cabin and suit cooling, and the heat shield is now exposed. The trunk is no longer needed. Um, that is setting us up for our deorbit burn here coming up. Uh, it's scheduled to start at 5.11 p.m. Pacific time. Again, we anticipate that will last about 11 minutes. Yeah, that burn, excuse me, that burn is an important one. That is what commits the crew to that location. Like we said, we're um, setting up for a landing off the coast of Tampa, Florida. Um, and it's that deorbit burn that um, is the final burn that Dragon performs to really re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, now, up next, we have the final steps that Dragon will perform prior to re-entry, the slew or maneuver to uh, deorbit de burn attitude and the deorbit burn itself. Leah, you did indicate that that attitude um, was correct and that we're gonna start that deorbit burn soon. Uh, that will be the last time that the forward Dracos which are the four thruster, thrusters located on top of the vehicle near the nose cone. Uh, it's the last time that those will ignite. The deorbit burn will place Dragon on a precise trajectory to uh, return to the splashdown zone off the coast of Florida. Um, and like Leah said, it'll last about 11 minutes once it begins. And again, we're tracking that to come around uh, 5.11 p.m. Pacific, so 8.11 p.m. Eastern time. And we are actually under an hour now until our anticipated splashdown time. So when we say things are happening fast, they are happening pretty fast. Um, but again, this is an autonomous flight like we've seen with Dragon uh, in the past. And our four crew members are riding comfortably, it appears. Their visors are still up. Um, once we get closer to that deorbit burn, we anticipate to hear a call from the core to the crew to go ahead and lower their visors just as a, a precautionary measure um, ahead of that major burn. That's right. And the crew has already completed the required suit leak checks. Uh, it's basically when they put pull all the zippers up, um, close the visor into the locked position, and uh, the Dragon spacecraft pressurizes or basically flows a little bit of um, that air into the suits and holds it at a certain pressure for a certain amount of time, usually a couple minutes, uh, just to make sure that those suits are, uh, all. basically all the zippers are in place and that that seal with the visor um, is functional and really just making sure that that the spacesuit provides its own individual environment for the crew member uh, during the more dynamic events of, uh, of today's procedures. So like Leah just said, um, we can see that those visors are still up, but we know that they've already completed the suit leak checks, had four good leak checks there. Um, you can, this is also a great shot because you can see the tablet 
on Commander Nicole Mann's leg. So those are the tablets that are used for monitoring Dragon's progress uh, and and the different statuses and states the vehicle is in. Um, it's also what they use to log the consumables during flight. So we talked before about that period of time where uh, the crew is off duty, they can do whatever they want to do. Um, and as you can imagine, being staying hydrating, staying staying hydrated is important. And they use those tablets to track um, how much water they drank and out of which water bottle it was. Um, so it's just helping to make make sure that everything is accounted for. Like we said, we're coming up to uh, the deorbit burn. We're about five seconds away from that uh, burn start. Now again, this is going to be an 11 minute burn approximately just over 11 minutes. It's pretty large. We've got to slow the astronauts down uh, from orbital velocity at 17,500 miles per hour and put them on that track to uh, to Tampa, Florida and that splashdown. If you look, you can see the windows near Josh Cassidy's feet. Uh, actually, it's in the background, but it's bright. It's, it's clearly they're in an orbital daylight. Um, but when you're traveling at orbital velocity, 17,500 miles per hour, you see a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. And if you look on their uh, crew displays, it looks like you can see some of the thrusters are firing. So um, sounds like the two orbit burn is underway. Again, started right on time at 5.11 p.m. Pacific, targeting about 11 minutes for that burn. We're looking at about 10 minutes and 20 seconds remaining in that two orbit burn. Within just the last 10 minutes, uh, Dragon jettisoned its trunk it initiated that orbit burn about two minutes ago now. So for these operations, NASA and SpaceX closely coordinate with the uh, United States Coast Guard and have established a safety zone to ensure public safety, safety of those involved and in the recovery operations, um, as well as, of course, our crew on board the returning spacecraft. So multiple notices are issued to the Mariners in advance and during recovery operations. And Coast Guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. So we want to take a moment to stress to the public the need to respect this safety zone. Um, recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation, and so any other boats interfering in this process can increase risk to the astronauts in the capsule, those teams working to recover them from the water, and of course even the safety of any public boaters. So for the safety of the crew and yours, uh, we recommend tuning in here. Just sit back and watch. We're going to give you the best views of our astronauts on their way home. <laughs> Like I mentioned earlier, this deorbit burn is the last time those four forward Draco thrusters will fire. Dragon Endurance has not yet entered the Earth's atmosphere. This deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site off the coast of Tampa, Florida. As you can see on your screen there right now, Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna are using their screens to keep tabs on that burn duration. Uh, the Draco thruster firings, which you can see lighting up on those displays in front of them. Um, the trajectory details like the entry angle, capsule per perigee, and how much distance remaining until deorbit burn termination. Um, so in that center screen, you can actually see uh, their trajectory, their planned trajectory there. Uh, Dragon is flying itself, so all of the crew, all, all that the crew has to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs on things, which I know for me personally, um, I love looking out windows when I'm traveling, especially <laughs> in airplanes. And so I imagine if I were flying, this part would be really hard for me because I oh, yeah. just want to get out of my seat and look out the window. <laughs> Those last few space views. I'm with you. I'm always a window seat girl. <laughs> Now, with Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna ready to deorbit and splash down back on planet Earth, they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX and NASA. All of these sites are located off the coast of Florida, either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Spreading the supported sites across multiple locations actually helps to maximize the return opportunities for this mission and future crews. 
uh, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. So pretty helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So yesterday, NASA and SpaceX together selected primary and alternate splashdown locations. Obviously, our primary, as we've discussed, is off the coast of Tampa, Florida, and the alternate is Daytona. This selection process works with a lot of different variables, including the space station's orbital trajectory, the landing sites available, and uh, favorable weather, as you mentioned. Of course, how much free flight capability Dragon has for the trip home and the sleep schedule for those returning crew members. We'll start with calculating daily return options based off of the space station's current orbit and Dragon's capabilities to maneuver and line up for re-entry. The time from undock to landing at the primary site can vary from less than six hours to more than 39. Getting home the quickest comes with some obvious benefits, but we always have to make sure that the crew uh, if, is properly rested for dynamic operations, preventing us from scheduling 20 plus hour days for them. Trajectory and ballistics experts provide the daily opportunities that would line up Dragon with the seven landing zones and split them into what we call ascending and descending opportunities. Dragon uses its Draco thrusters after leaving station to execute a series of altitude lowering maneuvers and to line up with this selected primary site. But it can also change to different alternate sites while in free flight if sudden weather moves in that we need to avoid. That's something we're currently or constantly looking at as weather, so we make the final call to proceed about two and a half hours before the crew undocks. For the Crew-5 return, as always, we look at a number of weather items. Some of those more obvious ones are no rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone, both for the safety of the crew in the capsule and the recovery teams on the water. We're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet per second or about 10 miles per hour and relatively calm seas so we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna back to Florida. Now, I have heard the weather described in four different ways for this Tampa site. <laughs> uh, I've heard go, very go, home run, and stupendous. So it sounds <laughs> like they have a pretty nice landing site waiting for them today. I think one time we also got super go. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's another level. <laughs> so once Dragon began flying free yesterday, there were a number of additional checkpoints to either proceed toward the primary site, head to the alternate, or select a new zone based on real-time weather data. These checks happened all the way up until we are in the final hours before the deorbit burn, which started about six minutes ago. That's this last burn in the trip home, and it commits the Dragon capsule to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a minute to meet our crew. First up is Nicole Mann on the left side of the screen there. She's the California native who holds a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and is a colonel in the Marine Corps. She was an F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet test pilot and deployed twice aboard aircraft carriers in support of combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nicole was selected by NASA in June 2013 and in the years that followed led the astronaut corps in the development of hardware in the Artemis program. She is the Dragon Commander for Crew-5, which was her first space flight. She's right there in the foreground of the shot monitoring the steward orbit burn. And she is also the first Native American woman to stay on the International Space Station. Sitting next to Nicole is Josh Cassida, who grew up in Bear Lake, Minnesota. The physicist and U.S. Navy test pilot flew 23 combat missions and later became an instructor at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, which is a common path military officers to take, uh, take to join NASA. Cassida is one of more than 100 graduates who became astronauts going back to the Mercury program. On Earth, he served as capsule commander in mission control, but for his first space flight on Crew-5, he has served as pilot on Dragon. In the role of mission specialist, you can't see him here. He's to the left of uh, Nicole. That's Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata. Koichi has a doctorate in aerospace engineering and in 1996 became the first Japanese mission specialist aboard the space shuttle Endeavour for STS-72. In addition to his current mission, Koichi flew four space shuttle missions, a Roscosmos Soyuz, and was on a long duration stay aboard the International Space Station. And just on March 6th, just a few days ago, Koichi reached his 500th day in space. Wow, that's pretty incredible. 
The second mission specialist is Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna, Anna Kikina. She graduated from the <laughs> this is a tough one. Novosibirsk State Academy of Water Transport in 2006. In 2012, Anna officially became a candidate for the position of test cosmonaut. Crew 5 was Anna's first flight into space as part of the resumption of integrated crews on U.S. cruise spacecraft and the Soyuz with the Russian State Space Corporation, Roscosmos. Now we are still in that deorbit burn. Those crew members now about 42 minutes away from that targeted splashdown time of 9.02 p.m. Eastern time. It looks like we have about two minutes left, maybe a minute and a half in that deorbit burn, but things are going well so far. All of those uh, four Draco engines firing for the last time before closing that nose cone and preparing the capsule for reentry. There on your screens, you can see the crew is continuing to monitor Dragon's progress in this deorbit burn. We have about a minute and a half, uh, one minute and 31 seconds to be exact, remaining in this burn. As you can see with those displays, there's um, a small set of physical buttons that the crew can use uh, for emergency situations. Um, and then the displays are touch screen, which has more features that they can use in flight in addition to the tablets that are on their legs. You can see Nicole's there on her left leg. We can also see a good shot of the control panel for the seats themselves. Um, that's where the mic volume and the push to talk button uh, is also located for the crew to use. Uh, and that's, I believe that's also where the crew cabin light button is located. <laughs> So just like an airplane, everybody has their own personal window, or excuse me, personal <laughs> light that they the can use. reading light. Yes. To read, exactly. <laughs> There's also USB ports in the Dragon capsule as well. <laughs> That's convenient. Yeah, not on the chairs. It's uh, kind of like above their heads. So they can't really reach them while in flight, but certainly useful during the opportunities where they don't have to be in their seats and can charge up those tablets that they use. Now continuing to monitor, again, we are in the deorbit burn and uh, should be wrapping up here very shortly. Crew members just monitoring as this is a completely autonomous flight. 10 seconds remaining in this deorbit burn. That deorbit burn is... Deorbit burn complete, performance nominal, nose cone closure initiated. Dragon copy. Just what we wanted to hear. Deorbit burn is complete, nominal is always the word we're looking for. Uh, and so with that complete, next up is closure of the nose cone since we won't be using those Draco thrusters anymore. That's right, that nose cone is what protects those Draco thrusters as well as that forward hatch, uh, which is the hatch that the crew of course used to dock to the space station and uh, get in and out of Dragon while it was docked on station. Um, that side hatch is what they will be using, or the side hatch which is on the side of Dragon is what they will be using to get out of the capsule after splashdown, um, but not that forward hatch, which is what is being covered up now um, as we, or what will be covered up as we step into uh, nose cone closure. Wow. And there we can see a live view of that nose cone closing on Dragon Endurance. So in the Dragon is currently inhibiting those forward bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete the deorbit burn. Uh, those are inhibited now, I should say, meaning that it was safe to latch the nose cone shut. Um, and the vehicles initiated the Nitrox suit purge. This will help keep Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna cool and comfortable during re-entry, which is coming up in about 20 minutes. At this point, like we saw, uh, the nose cone is closing, protecting the forward hatch for reentry. So Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna are using their screens to continue monitoring the locking of the nose cone, uh, which is done by a set of hooks. That's exactly right. Now we have a live view there of Mission Control Hawthorne, actually located just to the side of Leah and I. Um, that is where the calls are coming from that we hear to the crew, um, coming from SpaceX Corps Mike Blasco. Another view there of that nose cone closing. 
It was about another minute and 14 seconds remaining in the nose cone close. Um, but yeah, those, those calls that we hear uh, to the crew and um, basically communicating status of what's happening or what has completed, uh, that comes from that room that you see there on your screen. We're standing by for the confirmation of nose cone closure. Uh, we are now about 18 hours since undock yesterday. So we've mentioned that the crew has had time to rest, relax, maybe eat a little bit, take a nap. Um, but right now are monitoring the continuation of nose cone closure, just waiting on that call out uh, to the crew. About 30 seconds remaining now to nose cone close. As we said before, since we won't be using the four forward Draco thrusters um, and obviously the hatch is sealed and shut, we are able to close that nose cone. Um, it's an important step uh, because ultimately this is the, um, now that the trunk has been separated, this is the last major physical change that Dragon will undergo prior to deorbit burn. Dragon that the crew five crew members are flying on today is named Endurance. It was dubbed that by the crew three crew um, in honor of the endurance shown by the NASA and SpaceX teams as they were building and training or building the spacecraft and training the crew through the pandemic. So I thought that was a really nice uh, way to honor both the teams. Very fitting for sure. So we're standing by for the call out to confirm that the nose cone has been closed. And this is the last major physical change that Dragon undergoes prior to that deorbit, or excuse me, prior to uh, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. They've already completed the deorbit burn itself. Yes. Um, so this nose cone closure um, is an important, uh, one of the last steps <laughs> prior to that re-entry. That deorbit burn really commits us to uh, returning to Earth. There's not really any waving off after that happens. Um, and as we mentioned before, uh, we are targeting a splashdown off the coast of Tampa, Florida. And a look here at both teams monitoring the mission. Over on the left is uh, Mission Control in Hawthorne, and on the right is uh, Mission Control at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, home sweet home. Uh, they were in joint operations while Dragon was docked to the International Space Station and until the spacecraft exited the approach ellipsoid. So now the teams are uh, continuing to watch the, um, watch the re-entry of the spacecraft and prepare to welcome the astronauts home, but in a monitoring mode now, uh, since we are obviously quite a ways away from the International Space Station itself. And as for the crew on the International Space Station, they are uh, in a sleep period right now, but they do have the opportunity to watch these broadcasts and uh, watch their friends arrive back on Earth. So hopefully if they're watching, they still take some time to get a little shut eye later tonight. So at this point in time, the nose cone is closed. We're just waiting for that to be called out to the crew. Um, from the SpaceX core. Next up will be to uh, initiate that nitrox suit purge. Again, that just helps to keep the crew super comfortable during that re-entry period. And then coming up a little bit later uh, tonight around 5.50, 5 5.50 p.m. Pacific time, that's when the entry of the spacecraft will begin. And during that time, we anticipate to lose communication with the spacecraft as plasma is building up around it. Um, it is traveling through the atmosphere. Um, eventually, we will regain that signal and communication with the crew members. But of course, Dragon knows exactly what it's doing that entire way home. Uh, they are just monitoring and um, getting closer and closer to splashdown. Again, targeting splashdown for 9.02 p.m. Eastern time, 6.02 p.m. Pacific, off the coast of Tampa, Florida. Nose cone closure continues. It looks like the first set of hooks is closed and the second set is closing as we speak.
for our four crew members on Crew 5. For three of them, this was their first space flight. So Nicole Mann, Josh Cassida, and Anna Kikina are all coming home with 157 days in space. As we mentioned earlier, Koichi Wakata um, has, this is his fifth space flight. So he is coming home with a total of 505 days in space. And in following along with the procedures that the crew are stepping through. Um, Nose cone secured for entry. Dragon copy. And there is that confirmation of nose cone uh, closure that we were standing by for. Now, as we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now uh, beginning to inject that cooled nitrox or nitrogen oxygen mixture into the air being delivered to the suits worn by Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna. Again, that's what will allow the crew to remain super comfortable while the external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, so a little warm on the outside. Um, that heat shield is pointing forward, leading the capsule to the landing site. And speaking of the heat shield, Dragon's primary heat shield is comprised of PICA 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator. The first uh, generation PICA was actually first developed by NASA for studying and sampling comets within our solar system. Yeah, so SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop PICA X, which was the second generation product used on all Dragon 1 commercial resupply missions that successfully resupplied the station on over 20 or on 20 missions. PICA 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo spacecraft with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and drove down the cost and mass. The remainder of Dragon capsule is composed primarily of a SpaceX proprietary ablative material. Uh, it's another class of thermal protection, which is lighter weight uh, versus PICA and protects the underlying composite structure during that reentry to ensure that the structural capabilities are maintained. So while Dragon will experience temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit during peak re-entry conditions, the characteristics of the thermal protection systems, also referred to as TPS, coupled with the environmental cooling and life support system, which we refer to as ECLIS, that's in the pressurized interior, that will ensure that Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna stay cool and comfortable during all phases of re-entry through splashdown. After Crew Dragon Endurance has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, a series of parachutes will deploy to slow the crew's descent. The first will be two drogue parachutes, followed by the four main chutes to guide Dra Dragon to its first contact with Earth since launching in April uh, last year. Dragon will automatically deploy these parachutes when different pressure uh, and positioning sensors on the capsule detect that they are at the right speed and altitude. Uh, the vehicle velocity at the drogue deploy parachute timing is about 350 miles per hour. So they deployed about 18,000 feet. Now the vehicle velocity when the main parachutes deploy is at approximately 119 miles per hour. They'll deploy at about 6,500 feet. And when we have our water splash down, the spacecraft is traveling a cool and comfortable approximately 16 miles per hour. So the highest G, lo G load we expect the crew to experience during reentry is about three to five Gs. So again, with nose cone closure, uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, visual changes, like you mentioned, that we will see. Um, and our crew members are already in their suits and in their seats, as we had a preview of earlier. So coming up next uh, will be our anticipated loss of signal around 5.48 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, the crew just got an update on that from CORE here in Hawthorne uh, before we started the broadcast. So again, when we're in that entry period and plasma is building up around the spacecraft, uh, it makes it hard for us to communicate uh, back and forth. So during that time, we won't have communication with the astronauts uh, or the spacecraft itself. However, again, Dragon is fully autonomous and continues guiding those crew members uh, to our splashdown site in Tampa. That's right. That expected loss of signal or LOS, as you'll hear it called out, um, is coming up in 14 minutes on the dot, actually. Um, and 
It's something that happens every time uh, one of the crew dragon capsules returns to Earth. Um, it lasts only a few minutes, um, but it's something that uh, we will hopefully at that time be able to have some views of dragon as it is uh, re-entering the atmosphere. Um, but of course, after that, um, that entry point, um, like we mentioned before, those parachutes will deploy shortly thereafter, starting with those two drogue parachutes, uh, followed by the main parachutes, which are those beautiful orange and white <laughs> big parachutes that we just love to see um, um, uh, during, this, during that re-entry. And of course, the recovery ship tonight that will be uh, recovering the crew from the waters off the coast of Tampa is Shannon named in honor of Shannon Walker, who flew on the Crew-1 mission uh, back in 2020. Can't believe it's been three and a half years now. So at this point in time, um, as we mentioned before, we are a few minutes away from uh, the next major milestones, about uh, 12 uh, uh, about 12 minutes and 45 seconds from that anticipated LOS. Uh, we are taking your social questions uh, from social media. If you have one, be sure to uh, use the hashtag AskNASA, uh, and we'll try to get to them as we can. Sometimes, uh, especially after Splashdown, there's some waiting periods. Um, so we'd love to take some questions. We have a couple already, um, so let's t check out what that first one is. Uh, this one comes to us from Onchari. Um, what at what number is the space station at capacity? Are there interactions between the crew from different countries? That's a great question. Um, I think the fact that it's called the International Space Station um, is is definitely indicative of those interactions that take place among the crew uh, while they are on station. I personally love seeing photos of the crew whenever they're sharing meals together. Um, if if they can, I've, I've seen photos where they like to bring up food from um, that is representative of their country or their culture and share it with the other crew members on board. Um, it's just something I love seeing the crew do. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, different cultures have different holidays as well. So sometimes they share uh, those sorts of traditions and it's definitely the International Space Station. Uh, sometimes they work together on projects or even on spacewalks. Um, our JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata went out on, I believe, two spacewalks with Nicole Mann, our NASA astronaut, during their stay at the International Space Station. So a lot of working together while they are on board. And of course, there's a lot of work going on on the ground between our partner countries um, as we prepare for these missions. And the question also was um, a limit to the number of people on the International Space Station. So for the past week, we had 11 people on the space station. Sounds cozy. <laughs> it does. It sounds a little cozy, but the space station is also pretty big. Um, and twice it has housed 13 people. So I don't know that there is a uh, max limit that we have established or determined at this time, but we've seen 13 a couple of times before, and we just wrapped up a full house of 11. Let's take a look at another one uh, coming, us, coming to us from Jiu-Jitsu Panda. <laughs> I love that. Uh, can the astronauts work out or exercise on the space station? Thank you ahead of time. Uh, absolutely. In fact, they have to, right? Yes. It's it's required uh, in order to maintain their health, maintain their bone density, um, which ultimately you know keeps them um, working efficiently uh, while they're uh, while they are on station. But it's also part of the the study of how microgravity impacts the human body um, in terms of hey, if you do with this exercise, what is the result? Are you still um, maintaining the level of health necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And they have a few different exercise machines on the space station. So uh, I, was, I was talking with Shiva, there's a treadmill that you have to kind of wear a belt and it's hooked to the, the treadmill itself so that as you're running, you're not kind of floating off mm -hmm. with every step you take. <laughs> uh, there's also a stationary bike. Um, and then there's also the advanced resistive exercise device. We call it a red. Um, it can be modified so that you can use it to do um, arm workouts, leg workouts, anything from bicep curls to squats, even even ab workouts. So um, they've done a great job at providing options up there mm -hmm. and uh, the crew members are assigned to each one. So they don't get to choose a favorite and only get on the treadmill every day. They have to make sure that they're also maintaining their muscle mass and their bone density uh, with a little bit of weightlifting as well. Um, one thing that I never took into consideration until I heard it called out during the Crew 6 
um, docking period was um, basically uh, the Capcom at Mission Control in Houston, I think was talking to Josh Cassida, I, I can't quite remember, but it was speaking to one of the astronauts on station and basically told them, hey, you can't do your workout as scheduled because we're about to dock uh, crew six and just the vibrations created from the exercise in the space station, even though it is a really big um, floating laboratory, it's not floating, orbiting, um, it, it was, I never really thought that it had that much of an impact um, mm -hmm. to other things until uh, we heard that call out during that um, docking where we were right about to dock and it was basically like, hey, hold off on your scheduled exercise for right now. <laughs> right, right. We heard that yesterday as well before undock. So just want to mitigate any of those things yeah. that might impart loads on the International Space Station when you're in a dynamic event like a, a docking or an undocking. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, they do try and schedule their workouts around those those times. Um, yeah. Let's take a look at another question. Um, we have a couple minutes uh, here about seven and a half minutes until that um, loss of signal. SpaceX Dragon, all crews, satchels are secure, restraints tightened, visors are down. Dragon, we copy. Visors are down, restraints are tight, and tablets and satchels and loose items are secured. All right, good call out there, just uh, indicating that the crew has everything in place, locked away, make sure nothing, pardon me, uh, nothing can uh, escape its secure <laughs> location during the re-entry uh, portion and the visors are down. So um, basically the crew is locked and loaded, ready to, ready to come home. Uh, taking a look at this question um, coming to us from uh, Taniko to, Wow, this is tough. <laughs> Tiniko Tixa Baloy, I'm, I apologize for not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, when the dragon approaches Earth, how do you make sure that it does not collide with airlines, uh, with airplanes in flight? Uh, that's a great question. So part of the process to launch a spacecraft or bring it home is basically to get a license from the Federal Aviation Administration or the FAA uh, and basically request that that airspace and sea space be quarantined off um, in a keep out zone, basically, so that um, aircraft and uh, sea vessels are not in danger during this phase. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because you really have to think of, because the Earth is a sphere, uh, it's a globe, it is a three-dimensional process to re-enter the atmosphere. It's not just coming back down to Earth, it is that three-dimensional space, um, that airspace that has to be cleared uh, and, and safe, basically. Great question. That is a good question. And I've seen some pretty amazing pictures before of people in um, commercial airplanes as they yeah. are en route somewhere and, and can see uh, one of the spacecrafts yeah. lift off. So I would love to have that opportunity someday. <laughs> Same. Although with uh, how often um, we're launching out of um, Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center, uh, it's certainly more likely now than it ever has been to catch um, a, a rocket launch from your window seat uh, while flying into uh, Orlando Airport. <laughs> Another question coming to us, this one from Joshua Green. How do the departing astronauts make sure they don't accidentally leave any of their stuff on the International Space Station? And has anyone forgotten anything up there? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are checklists to make sure that the astronauts uh, don't leave anything on the space station. Um, and of course, I'm sure some something has been left behind at some point, <laughs> but there's always somebody going up and coming back down. So maybe one of their friends is kind enough to bring it back for them. Um, the crew members themselves have a very limited amount of space of what they can choose to take up. Um, I've heard it referred to as maybe like a shoebox size. So they might take up photos or jewelry or um, special mementos for their friends or family back home. Um, so those things I'm sure they keep close personal track of. But then additionally, there is a lot of cargo or uh, scientific research that is, excuse me, uh, loaded back onto Dragon before it comes home. So there are teams specifically dedicated to tracking the locations of items on the International Space Station uh, and make sure that our crew members load them up before it's time to come home. That's a good question. Yes. <laughs> Next one coming to us from Sooner Source. 
my son Dex would like to know how fast the capsule is going when it hits the water. Oh, that's actually a really great question. Um, when I'll back up first, um, when the capsule is on station and when it departs the space station, it's going 17,000 500 miles per hour or thereabout. Yes. It's going really, really fast. Um, and then we do that uh, deorbit burn, which helps to slow the vehicle down significantly. But at that point in time, it's still going, uh, I want to say it's about 500 miles per hour as it reenters the atmosphere. That heat shield that we talked about before is actually going to do a lot of work um, that gets converted into the form of heat, uh, that plasma that builds up, and actually slows it down. So um, the Earth's atmosphere is actually going to help us out um, in slowing the vehicle down even further as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then we have those two sets of parachutes. Oh. Dragon SpaceX for entry briefing. Pilsford Dragon. Okay, just to give you a quick update here for timeline, we are tracking no deltas in terms of vehicle status. Only item to note is that you may get the AGPS alerts when you come back out of blackout. Just wanted to keep you an update that if those have a VSDC at the end of it, there's no concern. It has no impact on Dragon's automated a flight, automated shoot deployment sequence. I'll copy. Okay, copy. We may get the APGS alerts if it's not Sierra Delta Charlie. That's no impact. Those are good words. Other than that, the weather's still looking good and we're uh, looking forward to getting you home shortly. Expected blackout time is in approximately two minutes or so. We'll see you on the other side at 0156 Zulu. Copy, see you on the other side. Wow, we got to that uh, anticipated blackout time pretty quickly. So again, that's coming up at about 5.58 p.m. Pacific time, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, about 5.48 p.m. Pacific time. And so about 30 seconds from now, uh, we will be out of communication with the astronauts and the Crew Dragon capsule during that time. Uh, the Corps mentioned an AGPS potential alert coming up after they uh, require signal. That will be, that is the absolute global positioning system. Uh, they had a couple of pop-ups earlier, but uh, as you heard the Corps tell the crew, those are not of any concern. Um, for them. Additionally, I uh, got a good report for everything on Crew Dragon, looking good as we head into uh, this entry period. There was one ground uh, item we were monitoring that the Corps discussed with the crew earlier this evening. Uh, the WB-57 will not be available due to a technical issue. Of course, this has no impact on the operations. It isn't necessary for return. Everything continues to go very smoothly. Uh, the main purpose that we fly the WB-57 is to collect engineering imagery in addition to what we get from the cameras on the boat. So we will have those cameras on the boat, uh, keeping their eyes out to spot our crew members as soon as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. That's right. Now, after Crew Dragon Endurance has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, a series of parachutes will deploy to slow the crew's descent. Uh, first will be the two drogue parachutes, followed by the four main chutes to guide Dragon to its uh, first contact with Earth, Earth since it launched. Uh, Dragon will automatically deploy those parachutes when different pressure and positioning sensors uh, on the capsule detect that they are at the right speed and altitude. And we were just talking about these speeds. So the velocity at the drogue deploy point, uh, we've slowed down to 350 miles per hour. Those deploy at about 18,000 feet. That is quite different from the 17,500 miles per hour we were just traveling before the deorbit burn. Yeah. Um, and then the velocity at the time of main parachute deploy is about 119 miles per hour. Those will deploy at about 6,500 feet. And then that gentle water splashdown, we will be traveling at about 16 miles per hour. Hour. So again, that highest G load we think is around three to five Gs. So they should be pretty comfortable uh, just monitoring again as all of those parachute deploys are autonomous.
again, we are, we are in that communications blackout period. It's just begun. That's right. Um, we're expecting that to last about seven minutes, excuse me, seven minutes um, due to the formation of plasma around the spacecraft. During that time, no vehicle telemetry is received by mission control or the recovery team, and no external commanding of the vehicle or voice communication is possible. As a reminder, Dragon is designed to fly itself, though. Um, during reentry, the vehicle will be slowing down from the orbital velocity of 17,500 miles per hour. The top temperature that Dragon will experience upon that reentry, um, in terms of the exterior temperature, is around 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So, as we mentioned before, we expect this blackout period to last several minutes. Um, we are basically now in that reentry period, uh, and we anticipate this uh, to. We, we anticipate getting that signal back in about five minutes from now. This is moving pretty quickly because we are anticipating those drug parachutes to deploy at about 5.58 p.m. Pacific time. So really just seven minutes from now, we're looking at splashdown around 11 minutes from now. So uh, this is a very uh, quick timeline, a lot of things happening in rapid succession as our crew members come home. But again, yeah. hearing we've heard good reports uh, so far and we are awaiting that acquisition of signal in around four and a half minutes. Now, one thing that if we were able to get views inside the Dragon capsule, um, which, like we said before, because of that plasma buildup, we, we are unable to, to get those views. But if you were watching earlier in the webcast, you did see those crew displays, uh, those touchscreen panels that the crew was using to monitor um, the, the health of the capsule, the state of um, what was, you know, the... The, the state of command for what the Dragon capsule was actually uh, executing. Um, as of right now, they also now have a little map that shows where they are and how much further they have to go for this reentry. Um, they will be able to follow along with the anticipated deployment of those parachutes. Um, one thing that the, the crew is trained to do is be aware of the surroundings. And of course, when those parachutes deploy, uh, because they are slowing the capsule down, it, there is a, um, a small jolt that occurs during that deployment. And so, uh, and also whenever they splash down, you'll also hear uh, brace for splashdown or brace for impact. Um, that is just the crew being aware and like just getting ready, holding onto their seats uh, for those moments where there's a little bit more um, of a, a noticeable feel to uh, where they are in their seats. Right, and I, I think it's very interesting after watching so many uh, splashdowns, um, whenever we have main parachute deploy, they, they don't open to their full uh, ballooned shape right mm -hmm. away. They do something called reefing. So they open up quite slowly, uh, or sometimes it appears that way. Mm -hmm. That way that jolt is not, uh, it's not exaggerated any more than it has to be. So they open up slowly uh, and slow the spacecraft down again to about 16 miles per hour. Again, we're in the anticipated um, loss of signal. There's uh, two minutes or about somewhere between two and three and a half minutes remaining. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell exactly when we'll be able to get that signal back, um, but we, in about three minutes, we will start hearing uh, the core um, reach out to the crew uh, to see if they can make that connection. Once again, the, the loss of signal is expected, totally normal, um, due to that buildup of plasma around the exterior of the capsule. And we also have our recovery teams already on site, already on uh, Shannon, the SpaceX recovery ship, and that is waiting off the coast of Tampa. Some of those team members arrived by helicopter. Uh, we have one of our NASA public affairs officers also on. And there's our first view of the Crew 5 crew in Dragon Endurance re-entering the Earth's atmosphere.
So this is a view from the recovery ship itself of Crew Dragon re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Of course, we still do not have communication with them because you can see that plasma buildup as they are uh, coming through the atmosphere, that heat shield doing all of the work to ablate that heat um, as it builds up around the capsule. So um, again, as we mentioned, you see the movements here. That's the ship camera moving uh, and continuing to track the spacecraft during re-entry. We anticipate uh, reacquisition of signal in just a couple of minutes from now. As Kate mentioned, it can it can vary uh, on when we get that timing. But great to already have a view of our four astronauts or three astronauts and one cosmonaut inside as they are headed home. There will also be a couple of sonic booms during that time frame. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check. As I mentioned, the SpaceX core. SpaceX Dragon, we have you loud and clear. We have you the same. Good to have you back. Expect automated chute deployment. Dragon copy. You know, it's incredible to know that the voice we're hearing is coming from that wow. gorgeous ball of light. <laughs> And all of the other little points of light you see around it, they appear to be um, streaking on the camera a little bit. Those are stars. Uh, obviously, that beautiful bright light in the middle. That's Crew Dragon Endurance coming home after 157 days in space. We are standing by for Drogue Parachute Deployment. That'll be in about two minutes, but we already do have acquisition of signal. That came, again, a little bit earlier than we expected. So That's right. it is a little hard to target sometimes. GPS has converged. Expect nominal altitude for drogue shoot deploy. Dragon copy. Again, that point of light in the center of your screen, that is Dragon Endurance, another uh, a different view. This one infrared coming from uh, the recovery ship. As we were mentioning, all of those uh, team members that are ready to recover the astronauts are on the ship. They're in position. It'll take just a little bit for them to move in toward the capsule once it lands, but uh, they all have a very important and distinct role to play, either retrieving the capsule or um, helping the astronauts egress, and uh, they are all standing by. At this point in time, Dragon Endurance is about to deploy the drogue parachutes. Um, those automatically deploy about around the 18,000 foot mark um, and the capsule is going about 350 miles per hour. Brace for drogue window. Dragon brace. So just to call out there to let the crew know that they are approaching that window where the drogue parachutes will automatically deploy. And just prior to the deployment, um, Dragon automatically safes the propulsion system and then deploys the parachutes to stabilize and help decelerate the spacecraft. So like we said, we're getting ready for uh, those uh, drogue parachutes to deploy on Dragon. That occurs automatically when it's about 18,000 feet above the um, ocean surface. And the capsule is going roughly 350 miles per hour um, in that view before, there was a difference, and uh, here we can see um, it's no longer quite streaking like it was just moments ago, or minutes ago, I should say. Um, like I said before, it looks like those drogue deploys are now... Yep. We got... Visual on two healthy drogues. Dragon copy. As you can see with that infrared view, we have two healthy drogue parachutes on Dragon. There's a view from Dragon looking up at the drogue chutes. Those will uh, remain attached to the spacecraft until they help deploy the main parachutes coming up in just a few moments. Again, these views coming to us from the recovery ship, standing by to recover our crew members once they splash down. Looks like we... Uh...
It looks like we have main parachute deployment there. Main chute descent rate nominal. Dragon copies, 1,000 meters. Beautiful. Copy, 1,000. Beautiful view there from that recovery vessel um, of Dragon Endurance with those four healthy main parachutes. At this point in time, the capsule's going about 119, or was going about 119 miles per hour when those were deployed, uh, and they also deployed about 6,500 feet. So these main parachutes will help slow the vehicle down even further to about... 800 meters. Copy, 800. Uh, so that we'll hear from the crew um, about how far they are above the surface of the water. Um, so there we just heard that call out for 800 meters. Um, the capsule is slowing down further and further. By the time that it uh, actually splashes down, it'll only be going about 16 miles per hour. It's fascinating to think that uh, just minutes ago, really, they were in outer space. Meters. Copy, 600 and are now just 600 meters above Earth. Again, we are targeting a 9.02 p.m. Eastern time, splashdown, 6.02 p.m. Pacific. So uh, that is the next major milestone for us today, now that we have four healthy main parachutes all deployed. Things continue to look good aboard Dragon. That's right, we're about a, a little less than a minute and a half away from uh, the crew splashing down. Toppy, 400 meters. Once again, we are targeting a splashdown off the uh, coast of Florida uh, near Tampa. So this is uh, what we would consider a gulf landing. And those uh, strobes of light on your screen, those are spotlights coming from the recovery vessels as they continue to track Dragon Endurance. 200 meters, crew braced for splashdown. Copy, 200 and braced. Commander Nicole Mann giving out that call as we are standing by for a splashdown off the coast of Tampa, Florida. There we can see the water uh, surface. Dragon Endurance coming closer and closer. And as you just saw, splashdown of Crew 5. 157 days in space. SpaceX Dragon splashdown. Names have been released. Copy Dragon, we concur with splashdown and mains released. Dragon Endurance on behalf of SpaceX, welcome home. As you can see on your screen, visual confirmation for splashdown. Thank you, SpaceX. That was on one heck of a ride. We're happy to be home. Looking forward to next time. Dragon Endurance has returned home, and NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Cassida, JAXA astronaut Kuichi Wakata, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina are back on Earth after an approximately 19-hour return journey from space. The SpaceX recovery ship and team has been waiting for Dragon splashdown, and now, as you can see, they're making their way to that splashdown location. Right, and these teams have been ready and been waiting about three nautical miles away, so it'll take them around 30 minutes to make their way to Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna inside Dragon. We will be uh, listening for Mission Control Hawthorne to give the go for the safe approach now that we have splashdown. There are several different roles. Uh, there is an approach boat that will begin inspections. They want to make sure that there aren't any uh, hypergalls, monomethyl hydrogen and nitrogen track tetroxide uh, still lingering around the spacecraft. That way it is safe for the uh, teams to move in even closer and retrieve it. Yeah, the crew will basically uh, approach the capsule um, and they use uh, what's basically a, a sniffing device, a device that can detect uh, those levels of MMH and NTO. Um, and 
um, they are toxic to breathe, and so this is a super important step to complete. Um, As Space of Dragon looks like we are in stable one, although a little tough. To Copy that, Dragon. We concur, and are happy to report that the recovery personnel have also confirmed stable one. Awesome. Thank you. So just some communication there back and forth with SpaceX Core, Michael Blasco, um, and uh, Capsule Commander Nicole Mann, just to confirm the landing position um, of the capsule itself. Um, as we can see there on your screen, even better now with that spotlight, <laughs> um, the crew the recovery team is approaching um, the capsule. They are going to make sure that that monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide is uh, not present on the exterior of the vehicle. Um, there could potentially be traces uh, due to the fact that those are the thrusters uh, that Dragon was using while um, um, in, in orbit, and so we want to make sure that there aren't any traces of those fumes, basically, so that the team can get close to the capsule. Um, we will actually see an individual climbing on top of the capsule to secure the um, the harnesses that are necessary, the rigging, uh, to uh, lift the capsule onto the recovery vessel. Um, as I have said <laughs> before, um, certainly a job that I would not be fit to do uh, as it involves, <laughs> uh, uh, as it requires jumping into um, what we can see is dark water <laughs> um, and climbing on top of the capsule and securing that, that heart, those harnesses. Where's your sense of adventure? <laughs> <laughs> um, as we heard, the core and uh, the crew communicate. The capsule is in stable one. That means it's in an upright position in the water. Uh, makes it easier to recover, obviously. That is the ideal a splashdown position for the capsule itself. So the crew members are still inside. They are still in their suits, in their seats. They will remain that way until the spacecraft itself is lifted onto the recovery vessel. Um, but the first ships arrive are those fast boats. Um, again, they are just checking out the spacecraft, making sure that it's safe for the rest of the team to approach. So for those of you that have just recently joined, the uh, Crew 5 team has splashed down uh, off the coast of Tampa, Florida. Uh, that occurred just minutes ago, and the recovery teams are now moving into place. And we're anticipating that uh, those First approach boats will arrive at the capsule just a few minutes from now. Dragon, SpaceX is go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personnel alongside Dragon in one minute. Dragon copy. SpaceX Core just giving the crew a heads up. Hey, you might be seeing some people on the outside of the capsule. It's to be expected. <laughs> yeah, first people that they've seen uh, on Earth, you know, in almost six months. That's right, 157 days in space. Now complete uh, as Dragon Endurance with the Crew 5 crew. Um, now safely back on Earth. Again, this was the first flight, uh, so the first re-entry experience as well for three of these crew members, uh, Nicole Mann, Josh Cassida, and Anna Kikina. I'm sure that Koichi Wakata, who now has 505 days in space <laughs> across five space flights, told them a lot of what to expect, but it was a new spacecraft for him too. So um, a lot of new and exciting experiences on today's ride home. As we said before, the crew generally experiences between three to five Gs during the reentry portion of the um, uh, of their journey home. So not too bad. Just like a, a really good roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> Again, these views coming to us from recovery vessels off the coast of Tampa, Florida, had an on-time splashdown at 9.02 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, from what we can see, 
I would say those weather reports were pretty accurate. Uh, we had clear skies, able to see the spacecraft coming down under those four main parachutes and even the drogue chutes as well. Um, and the seas look pretty calm also. That's right. So as Leah just said, that splashdown occurred seven minutes ago. In a few minutes, um, so there's there's still more things that has to occur. It's, um, we can't just pick up the capsule and put them on a boat and bring them out. <laughs> um, very similar to their activities in space, their activities here for recovery back on Earth are also uh, very highly uh, coordinated and, uh, and and choreographed, really. Um, so we can see that the approach boat has reached the capsule. Um, we should see. Uh, hopefully, it might be it might be tough because of the distance, um, but we will hopefully be able to see uh, one of the SpaceX recovery team members will actually hop in the water um, and then pull themselves up onto the capsule to basically secure the harnesses that are required to lift the capsule onto the recovery vessel. Um, as of right now, if we were able to see. Dragon SpaceX requesting permission to come on board via the display camera view only. SpaceX Dragon, you are welcome on board. All right, so just. We copy. SpaceX Mission Control basically just making sure it's okay for us to turn those interior cameras on. So we should get a view, um, the one that we saw before that sits uh, between pilot Josh Cassida and Commander Colt Nicole Mann. Um, so we can see the, the screens that they're looking at. Um, but as we were saying, the, the recovery team is circling the vessel, just making sure um, that there are no hypergol fumes there that are present. Um, there's also another team circling and gathering the parachutes from the water um, uh, to try and recover those as well. Um, I, once we hear the call out that there are no hypergols present, the, the recovery team will be able to take off their, um, their respirators. So if we were able to see them, they would have um, personal protection, excuse, excuse me, personal protective equipment on uh, those breather masks, basically, to make sure that they're breathing clean air uh, to ensure that, um, and, they, and they will do that until that they are sure that there are no hypergol fumes present. course during this time oh look here we are that's our uh, crew five astronauts now back on earth again on the left you can just see the top of her uh, helmet visor that's commander nicole mann nasa astronaut and on the right nasa's josh cassada the pilot for the mission spacex is back on board with the display camera only garden cutting so oh, that's the inside of that capsule we were seeing uh, sitting in the water just off the coast of Tampa. Also on board, we have, oh, and a thumbs up there from Nicole <laughs> Mann and Josh Cassada. I imagine probably the same from Koichi Wakata and Ana Kikana, uh, but to their right and left as the mission specialists. And a good look again at those crew displays. Um, Dragon, again, a totally autonomous flight home. They are just able to monitor the next steps. Uh, and a wait for the spacecraft to be picked up by the recovery vessel. So once those ordnance and hypergol checks are complete, it'll take about uh, 18, a little less than 20 minutes for the rigging to be complete. And around the same time, we expect the recovery ship to arrive. Um, and shortly thereafter, they will begin to lift Dragon onto the nest on the recovery ship. They'll pull it toward a platform Dragon, SpaceX, hypergol sweeps and unfired ordinance checks are nominal. Rigging is in progress. Approximately 25 minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for PMC with SpaceX flight surgeon. Dragon, So confirming good ordnance and hypergol checks, meaning they didn't detect any of those fumes uh, that would prevent us from coming closer to the spacecraft, as well as we are um, anticipating they will have a private medical conference with the SpaceX flight doctors. This is normal routine for astronauts. Uh, they have them regularly on the International Space Station. Um, they have them after launch and obviously after splashdown. So just a chance for the crew members to check in uh, with the medical teams. 
That's right. So that view there on the right hand side, um, there is now an individual uh, who is basically climbing or will be climbing on top of the Dragon capsule to secure the harnesses and the rigging um, that we will use to lift the Dragon capsule out of the water and onto that recovery vessel. That recovery, the larger recovery vessel is en route. Um, it is getting closer and closer <laughs> to the Dragon capsule, so we should have some better views uh, as time continues. But as that call out that we just heard uh, about a minute ago, um, everything checked out from the uh, the hypergall standpoint. Uh, none uh, were lingering, and so the crew, the recovery team, excuse me, is okay to take off those uh, those respirators that they were using for safety purposes and proceed with the nominal um, uh, rigging procedures. Once these crew members arrive on the recovery vessel, Shannon, uh, they will again be placed in the nest. The uh, Endurance spacecraft itself will be placed in the nest and move to a platform where the astronauts will egress, that side hatch being opened for the first time in 157 days uh, since launch last October. Might have been a false alarm, <laughs> false Quindar. <laughs> so they, uh, the astronauts will egress, um, and as with every space flight that we see, whether they are flying, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, here in America on Dragon, or if they are in a Soyuz spacecraft, all astronauts and cosmonauts receive medical checkouts after they land. Uh, again, this is our totally normal procedure just an opportunity for them to get checked out. Uh, it is quite an environment change coming back from 157 days in microgravity back to uh, 1G here on Earth. That's absolutely right. But one thing that is for sure um, of the recovery, uh, excuse me, of the splashdown and recovery um, views that we've had whenever we see the crew um, coming out of the capsule, I've yet to see somebody come out that didn't have a smile on their face. <laughs> oh, how can you not? They, they just said it was one great ride. So yeah. I'm sure they're all excited, uh, number one, for the experience and the accomplishments that they have. But also, now they're back home. They get to mm -hmm. spend time with friends and family. Uh, they will be helped onto a stretcher, as we've seen before, um, just to help them get their land legs back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it will take about 25 minutes. Um, so we heard, uh, let's see, about two minutes ago, um, we heard that it will take about 25 minutes for uh, the entire rigging process to complete and to lift the capsule um, onto the recovery vessel. Uh, we can see there on the right-hand side of the screen that rigging is in process. Uh, the left-hand side of your screen, of course, is a view inside Dragon Capsule, uh, where the crew is using those touchscreen displays to monitor progress of everything. Uh, I imagine they can also hear what's going on <laughs> outside as well um, in terms of the individual that is uh, crawling around on top of the capsule to secure those harnesses. Been 15 minutes now since we had splashed down. Uh, 9:02 p.m. Eastern time again off the coast of Tampa. Everything uh, was looking really nice tonight for mm -hmm. that on-time splash down right on the minute. That's right. We even had acquisition of signal about a minute earlier mm -hmm. than um, originally anticipated. But as we said before, um, that's it, it's not an exact uh, time that we know it comes back. So um, we were happy, certainly happy to hear. Uh, Commander Nicole Mann's voice come through pretty loud and clear. And of course, these uh, checks and, and the rigging and uh, lifting Dragon itself take time and, and the teams are very deliberate and take the time that they need uh, to make sure that everything is done properly and safely. But I do think it's very uh, impressive and, and funny to me that within two hours, you can go from being in space to already back on uh, back on land on 
uh, the recovery ship. It's it's faster than my flight from California to Houston. So <laughs> I always think that's very fun. Speaking of timelines, uh, it's also been pretty incredible to see the um, continuous improvement of the recovery process itself. So thinking back to the Demo 1, Demo 2 um, missions where uh, really that process of, of um, lifting the capsule out of the water, um, I forget how long it took the first time we officially did it. I think it was about an hour and a half. Um, and it's really well streamlined um, at this point in time. You know, this is the um, the fifth operational uh, mission to the International Space Station. Of course, we launched Crew-6, but they're still up there. Um, so this is the fifth one to um, to splash down and then plus Demo-2 uh, with NASA astronauts uh, Bob and Doug, um, you know, our favorite space dads. And uh, it's just been really cool to see how, as the SpaceX recovery teams have basically iterated the process um, a number of times, not only with the actual landings, but with practiced ones as well, um, with a, a Dragon capsule uh, mock-up. So um, it's pretty cool to see how streamlined the the operations have been. And there we can actually see um, our first good view of that SpaceX recovery team member that is climbing on board the Dragon capsule. Um, this is exactly what they have to do uh, in order to place the harnesses and the rigging and secure them. Those the, That equipment, of course, is critical to the lifting operation uh, where we lift the Dragon capsule out of the water and place it onto the recovery vessel. So um, we'll be able to see this individual move around um, almost in a spider monkey-like fashion <laughs> <laughs> um, with just such skill, um, which is incredible when you think about the fact that um, you know, they had to get in the water first and swim up to the capsule. And so um, their wetsuit is wet. The parts of the dragon of the capsule itself are also wet. So um, it's not an easy job. And they undergo significant amounts of training in order to uh, perform this job, um, not only correctly, but safely as well. And this was a role, a similar role also existed during Apollo. Those were also obviously splashdown mm -hmm. missions. Uh, those were called frogmen, <laughs> and so they would make sure that the capsule was secured uh, before it was brought into the recovery vessel. But speaking of recovery vessel, as we mentioned, we have uh, several team members that are uh, monitoring and assisting with different roles, whether that is um, to help with medical checks or to bring the crew uh, dragon back into the ship itself. Uh, we also have my colleague, NASA Public Affairs Officer Chelsea Bayarte, who is on the ship, and she is standing by on the phone uh, to give us an update. So Chelsea, tell us what it's like, what the teams are doing right now. Now, um, and if you were able to see Crew Dragon as it returned to Earth. Hey, Leah, how do you hear me? Loud and clear. You sound great. Oh, my gosh. Well, hello. Ahoy from the SS Shannon recovery ship. Welcome. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. So tell us what the team members are doing right now to prepare to bring Crew Dragon aboard. Absolutely. So let us let me walk us back a couple of just minutes ago as the Crew Dragon came down. We went to the tip top of this boat on the helicopter pad to get a view. The boat lights turned completely off. You could see every star in the sky. That's how dark it was. And all of a sudden, you see the brightest shooting star you ever saw in your life pointing down at Earth. And I was amazed how quickly... After those parachutes deployed, the shooting star went away and it just became another dot in the sky among a sea of stars. But this boat had, and several other boats in the area, turned on their spotlights. They had a drone pointed at it. So you always knew where the, where the dragon was, even though to me, it just looked like another dot. So they were very quick to locate the spacecraft in the sky as it came down. I had my eyes on Dragon just a minute ago. The boat, the SS Shannon right now is, is turning to get into a configuration now that we know that we're uh, safe from hypergalls to go closer to the, the Dragon. 
I think that's it is. See it with your own eyes. <laughs> Yes, that's amazing. Just in space moments ago, and now we are getting views from the recovery ship as well. We can see it uh, backing up towards the spacecraft. We also had great views coming from the ships during that descent. Uh, so can you tell us uh, what's next for the teams and uh, what's next for you and the other visitors on Shannon? Well, we may have lost communication with Chelsea, but uh, what an experience to be able to be there and see it. I'm very fortunate enough to have shared that experience. I was going to um, say, I think I recall whenever you were the person on the phone. Yes, <laughs> it was It was absolutely incredible. She's right. It's like a shooting star. Um, and great to hear, you know, that things have been going well on the, the ship so far. As she mentioned, we were seeing those um, it looked like strobe lights almost, but those were the spotlights tracking Crew Dragon as it continued its descent. So yes, they had great uh, coverage of that the entire time. So we have a great view here of um, Dragon Endurance there with the Crew 5 uh, crew still in their seats, strapped in, um, kind of like that part of the roller coaster after it ends. You still have to stay in your chair <laughs> until the attendants give you the okay and lift the the, the bar <laughs> um, to the, the, that keeps you in. Um, so yeah, we can see that that recovery team in the water. Um, if you look closely, you can see some of those harnesses hanging um, there in front of the side hatch. Um, we can see the recovery team members on Shannon there near the nest um, that they're also preparing that landing area. So the part of the, the ship um, that arches above where those crew members are standing, uh, that will uh, actually actuate outward and um, that will be the part that lifts the Dragon capsule out of the water and it will basically bring it right over where that nest is um, and it will be the Dragon capsule will be set down on that nest and then that uh, nest will then be pulled forward um, so kind of like if you think of yourself, like that nest will be, will be pulled in the direction of you as the viewer um, toward the forward end of the boat. And that is, of course, where um, the side hatch will be opened and the crew will egress uh, there using that side hatch. Now, when that side hatch is, is opened, this will be the first time that the crew uh, inside the Dragon capsule has uh, basically breathed earthly, <laughs> earthly air um, in 157 days. Um, it's the first time that that side hatch will have been opened. Of course, the last time it was open was launch day. Um, and that side hatch was closed in preparation for launch. And then uh, while they are on station, they use the forward hatch or the, the hatch that is underneath the nose cone there, uh, which is the pointy end of the Dragon capsule. So um, it's, I always love seeing that hatch reopened because it's, it's a very nice bookend in terms of um, when that hatch was last closed, that was the day that they went to space. And today's the day that they came home. Absolutely. And that journey beginning back in October and ending just 25 minutes ago, an on-time splashdown at 9.02 p.m. Eastern. And everything is really moving along with the timeline. Um, ideally, you know, the recovery ship arrives about 30 minutes after splashdown. And here we are mm -hmm. uh, almost ready to complete that rigging process. You can see that team member still on the capsule itself. Um, and they will, again, as you mentioned, lift that and place it in the nest. And the platform that the astronauts egress on is built up a little bit because the side hatch is about halfway up the capsule itself. So um, they will egress to that, be taken out for some routine medical checks. And eventually they will board a helicopter tonight just within... Um, within a couple of hours of splashing down that will take them back to Florida before they fly back to Houston and Anaki and I will also fly back to Russia. Yeah. So we're getting to the point in time where, oh, there we can see that lifting arm um, being moved into the uh, recovery position. Uh, everything's going to move pretty quick at this point in time. Um, it, the, the, the capsule will be in that nest uh, much faster than you think it will be. Um, we can see that recovery team member 
um, that was in charge of securing all of the harnesses and the rigging still on the capsule. Um, we should see them jumping off and back into the water in, uh, momentarily. That will be a good sign to indicate that all those harnesses are secure and in place. Although I imagine it would be kind of fun to um, ride Dragon as it gets lifted out of the water, but <laughs> certainly not, not safe, so we won't be doing that. And when they lift Dragon, it's also very stable the entire time. It's not swinging around a lot because there are those different attachment points mm -hmm. uh, that make it very, uh, very stable for the crew members coming out of the water and being placed on the recovery ship. Yeah, of course, the the motion of the waves creating a lot of that movement. And there we can see that recovery team member jumping off and <laughs> back into the water. So at this point in time, it's a great sign. Uh, we should uh, hear a call out soon or, or perhaps just see it first um, of the capsule being lifted out of the water. Again, this will happen quite quickly. Dragon, brace for capsule lift. And as the capsule is being lifted, there's our first view of that heat shield. Once again, that was the uh, the primary decelerator for the Dragon capsule. That's really what helps slow the vehicle down uh, to about 350 miles per hour from 17,500, of course, during that uh, re-entry burn that we saw. Um, Certainly did its job. Yeah. <laughs> bringing them to that gentle splashdown uh, with the help of those parachutes about 16 miles per hour. So they are, they have obviously lifted Dragon. They are placing it in that nest. Uh, they'll secure it there and, and remove some of those attachment points before moving it toward the egress platform. Now we can see some waters um, held in what looks like a kind of like a bucketed area there underneath the side hatch. Uh, that is the location of where the main parachutes are stored. So all four of those main parachutes are tightly packed um, and, and placed in that um, cubby, basically, and we can see water draining from it now. Um, the location of the drogue parachutes uh, is up near where that harness is, is secured above the, um, above the side hatch there at the top. And it's always interesting for me to see those attachment points because, you know, before seeing these missions or um, before working at NASA, you, you would always assume that the parachutes would just come from the top of the spacecraft. <laughs> um, so not always the case. Looks like Dragon is getting comfortably seated in the nest. Again, things moving along pretty quickly. Uh, a few minutes ahead of the ideal timeline here. Now just 30 minutes since splashdown. And we already have the spacecraft on the recovery vessel. Again, this one, this recovery vessel being named Shannon after Shannon Walker. Dragon, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are completing final checks. Stand by for translation to the egress platform. So at this point in time, the crew five uh, crew members are feeling a different sensation now. So when they splash down, of course, they're greeted with gravity once again, um, but there was an additional sensation of being in the water. And now that they are on the recovery vessel, it, it is clearly more secure than that, uh, or not more secure, uh, uh, less, a lot less uh, motion than being in the water. Of course, they're still on a boat, so there's a little bit. Yeah, and after uh, after these connection lines are removed. Uh, we'll be looking forward to hatch opening. Of course, we have to move the Dragon to that egress platform first, uh, but Dragon will stay in this hatch, or in this nest, I should say, um, until uh, it returns to port. So while the astronauts will be flown back to Earth, or they're on Earth, but once they're flown back <laughs> to solid ground tonight, uh, it does take a little bit of a journey for the spacecraft itself to make it back to port, and it's going to remain in that nest the entire time. So following along with the uh, recovery procedures, we're looking at roughly five, uh, five to six minutes until we get that side hatch open. Um, once again, assuming that um, the 
all the checkouts. Of course, the uh, the the capsule, the Dragon capsule itself, is uh, equalizing the pressure uh, inside to match the pressure outside as well. Um, and ultimately, the crew is just continuing to monitor the progress. Uh, they're using those screens in front of them, uh, but they remain comfortable in their seats. We continue to flow that nitrox air through the suits in order to keep them comfortable. Um, of course, I always like to say that uh, that air is the same stuff that scuba divers use to, uh, you know, in their breathing equipment. So uh, that cooled air is certainly um, an additional piece of comfort for the crew during this this process because as we said before right now there's nothing for them to do but uh patiently wait for the, for that uh for the translation of the dragon capsule into that for more forward position as leah was talking about uh, where we will be able to open the side hatch and again, obviously, we've got Dragon Endurance on the left and that view on the right coming from inside the spacecraft itself. Our four Crew 5 members, as you mentioned, patiently waiting, uh, no action on their part, just continuing to monitor and uh, as they are now aboard Recovery Vessel Shannon. Like I said, this is named after Shannon Walker, NASA astronaut who flew on the Crew 1 mission. There's also another SpaceX recovery ship uh, named Megan after Megan MacArthur, who flew on Crew 2. So once again, we're standing by for the capsule um, for that forward translation to the egress platform. Um, which is where we will be able to open Dragon side hatch and ultimately allow the crew to egress. And as we've mentioned tonight, the crew will board a helicopter that lands on that helipad where Chelsea was uh, talking about watching splashdown from. Uh, they will be transported back to shore tonight. Additionally, along with them, uh, there will be a couple of more helicopters that take off and take uh, some of the additional visiting personnel, including Chelsea, who gave us the report from the boat. Uh, and, and not only people, but they're also taking some uh, time critical science some uh, samples from the astronauts themselves. They'll return those extremely quickly to the scientists on Earth. And there we can see that Dragon Endurance is now making its way to the egress platform with that forward translation of the capsule. Slow and steady, but this is the last major move for Dragon. After this, we will uh, wait patiently for hatch opening. And there you can see that platform I've been discussing. Uh, just behind it is a little hallway. There are some medical checkout rooms for the crew members to get those, as I mentioned, very uh, nominal uh, and very planned medical checkouts now that they are back on Earth. We were able to see the recovery team hosing um, the capsule down. Uh, we're using fresh water to do that, of course, to help minimize uh, any corrosion to the capsule as we do reuse these. So basically just trying to give it a, a fresh water bath <laughs> um, as it is on the deck. We're also able to see that the recovery team um, on the platform has their personal respirators or breathers. Um, they are going to do an additional hypergol sweep. Um, that is to uh, basically triple check that there are no fumes for uh, the MMH or NTO, um, that monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. Um, those are the pro propellants that are on board the Dragon capsule for its on-orbit propulsion system. Uh, and they are not fumes that are uh, you're able to breathe. They're quite toxic to people. So uh, we'll see them perform an additional check. So once we do open the hatch, the first smiling face that Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna will see will be a SpaceX medical doctor. Uh, just to check on them, ready, see if they are ready for egress. Uh, we hope to get some views shortly thereafter of our crew members. 
And here is a great view of the hatch itself. Again, next major milestone will be for hatch open. Absolutely. So as we mentioned before, uh, while Dragon's top hatch is what is used to connect to the space station or the forward hatch, uh, the astronauts are going to egress from that hatch right there. That's the side hatch. Um, and before opening the hatch, the uh, spacecraft's cabin pressure uh, is equalized with the outside environment. Then once that side hatch is opened, uh, that will be... That will be the crew's first breath of uh, fresh earthly air since boarding Dragon um, at the start of their mission back in October. Now right here you can see uh, SpaceX crew members. We also have some NASA crew members on the spacecraft itself or on the um, on the recovery ship itself. They are on the spacecraft too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, letting the SpaceX teams take care of preparing Dragon for hatch open. And once that happens, it's important to note again, Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna will be getting that assistance from the recovery teams when they're exiting the capsule. Uh, it is the same process for any returning long duration crew members because returning to a gravity environment can uh, challenge our vestibular system. That's responsible for maintaining our balance and motion. And of course, safety is always the number one priority with this operation. So you'll see Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna helped out of the capsule, assisted a few feet to the medical quarters aboard the boat. And if you've ever watched crews return on a Soyuz or even previously uh, with Dragon, this is the same process as when they are carried from the capsule to waiting chairs. And then uh, for in the case of a Soyuz, there's a waiting medical tent. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this is also the time period where that time critical cargo can be recovered from the spacecraft with the remainder waiting until the ship is back in port. But some of those cold stowage items, uh, they're able to get that back to the uh, investigators and the researchers as soon as tonight. So they're able to analyze that. And then once the ship and the capsule return, the recovery team will perform some additional inspections before loading Dragon onto a flatbed truck at the SpaceX facility in Cape Canaveral for post-processing and, of course, potential future reflight. So we're about five or six minutes away from crew egress. We can see that the uh, personal protective equipment Dragon, stand by for a side hatch opening in approximately the next 60 seconds. I'm looking at Rick right now. <laughs> so we can see that those, uh, and there it is, side hatch open on Dragon Endurance. First time since it was closed last October, sending these four crew members on their journey to the International Space Station. And in that view on the right, you can see that SpaceX medical doctor getting that first check, uh, making sure everyone is feeling all right back here on planet Earth before we begin uh, helping those crew members out of the capsule. On the left-hand side of the screen, we can see the recovery team members placing a protective frame around the interior of the hatch. As I mentioned before, of course, we uh, reuse our Dragon capsules, and so really to preserve the integrity of that hatch, which of course is important, uh, we put some protective framing around there to help uh, as, help make sure that the, there is no damage incurred to the side hatch as the, the, the as the crew members are exiting or egressing from the capsule. I'm still able to get some uh, some notes from Chelsea. She said there's a big round of applause on the recovery vessel now that the hatch is open. A really great moment. Really signifies the end of a successful mission. So as we mentioned before, that the the individual that you see there on the right hand side of your screen between uh, pilot Josh Cassida and Commander Nicole Mann, that is the SpaceX medical doctor, always the first person to pop in. Um, basically just looking for four thumbs up from um, the crew members to indicate that they're feeling all right and uh, ready to egress the capsule. We'll also get a chance for uh, one of the photographers. We, we do have photographers on the recovery ship as well that are uh, able to document the splash down itself. So, um, oh, as I mentioned, <laughs> going to get that shot. Hopefully four smiling faces. 
I'm sure they're using a wide angle lens to capture uh, everyone's smiling faces. And the other thing you can note there on the exterior of the Dragon Capsule um, is the, the evidence of re-entry. Um, you can see there with some slight scorch marks uh, on the thermal protective system there. It was a very pristine white uh, on launch day. <laughs> and within the last hour, um, of course, it re-entered the atmosphere and splashed down. And we can see that evidence there on the exterior of the capsule. Yeah, the heat shield obviously did a great job uh, bringing back our crew members safely. And this is the second flight for this capsule. So there is the opportunity for it to be uh, taken back and uh, refurbished or uh, polished up prepared for another future flight. So for those of you just recently joined, the crew is, uh, the crew five astronauts and cosmonaut are now on board the recovery vessel and we are awaiting their egress from Dragon Endurance. They will come out one at a time, assisted by the recovery team members. As you can imagine, after spending uh, 157 days in space, gravity might not feel uh, super awesome right now, and so we will assist them just to make sure that they are safe um, making their first uh, first motions back on Earth. You can see them passing out of the capsule. Those are the tablets that we noticed earlier uh, the crew members wear around their upper thigh. They're able to monitor uh, procedures on those tablets, so they're starting to pass those out of the hatch. I think I've seen all four come through, and that was a foot rest. Uh, those can be detached, obviously, here on Earth or whether on orbit to have a little bit more space in the capsule. So they'll remove those four foot rests to allow teams to uh, more easily enter Dragon and help these crew members um, back on board the ship. Again, this view here in Mission Control in Hawthorne, California, teams at SpaceX monitoring the return and arrival of Crew 5. Coming up on about 45 minutes since splashdown tonight, the side hatch is open. Crew members are being prepared for egress. Everything has moved really smoothly tonight so far. Once again, that is a view um, looking toward the side hatch. That view uh, has Commander Nicole Mann on the left-hand side and pilot Josh Cassida on the right-hand side. So they're most likely debriefing the crew members on, um, you know, what to expect the next the, the next steps for their next steps. <laughs> <laughs> and helping them get out of their seat belts, um, just making things easier for that egress. We saw those foot restraints or the, the foot rests were removed from the spacecraft. So uh, just making things easier for our crew members. As you can see, their visors are up. They are uh, hopefully pretty comfortable in those custom fitted suits, as well as those seat inserts that are uh, custom fitted as well. Again, these are SpaceX team members. Uh, it helps distinguish due to the different colored uh, flight suits they're wearing. So they're wearing black suits. And typically when you see someone in a uh, royal blue suit, that is a NASA team member. So we saw a couple of those from the other view. But right now, this is mainly the SpaceX crew um, inside Dragon helping the... Oh, and there's a few of those uh, NASA team members, as we mentioned. That's a great shot because you can really see that scorching on the thermal protection system, as I was talking about earlier, that evidence of reentry. Um, the exterior of the capsule got up to uh, 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and um, it's 
I think it's quite beautiful to see <laughs> uh, returned capsules, of course, because, um, you know, it's just that evidence of, of space flight. And success. Absolutely. Just a slight toasting. <laughs> And just a reminder, of course, once these astronauts are helped out of the capsule, we'll see them uh, being placed likely on stretchers, um, again, helping them regain their Earth legs. They'll then move into those routine medical checks. Those happen on the boat. Uh, and shortly after those, they will board a ready and waiting helicopter to head back to land. Once they come back to uh, Florida, there will be a NASA spacecraft waiting for them to bring them back to Houston. They'll be able to reunite with their friends and family. And it looks like our egress is beginning with NASA astronaut Josh Cassida, pilot of Dragon Endurance on Crew 5. His first space flight coming home with 157 days. I believe there is a um, almost like a little slide um, that is secured to the exterior of the capsule and to the egress deck, basically to, to bridge that gap. Yeah, we could see Josh um, sliding out of the frame there. And that really just helps them um, get out of the capsule, not only from the standpoint of making it easier on them, but also preserving um, the, the hardware the, around that, uh, the hardware of the side hatch as well. Of course, all those buttons that we see there on the crew displays are all now completely deactivated um, now that the Dragon capsule is uh, recovered and, and uh, secure on the recovery vessel. So even if somebody were to bump one with their elbow or their head, nothing would happen. Those have all been saved. So Josh Cassada, NASA astronaut, our first crew member out of the spacecraft. Looks like those SpaceX team members are back inside Dragon Endurance and uh, they are helping I doubt we'll hear any more of those those calls from the crew to the ground now that the hatch is open, but every time I hear it, I pause a little bit. <laughs> yep. I, if I had to guess, that was probably that recovery team member accidentally bumping the armrest comm panel, <laughs> um, which is the comm panel that they use to uh, basically push to talk uh, while they're in their seats. So if I had to guess, that was uh, uh, an accidental bump there. So it looks like the second individual to egress from the Dragon capsule will be Commander Nicole Mann. And there she goes. Also 157 days for Nicole, being that it was her first space flight. I would imagine for Koichi, who um, you mentioned earlier, has, uh, you'll have to refresh my memory, over 500 days now logged yes. in space? Yes, yes, uh, exactly 505. There today. we go. So I imagine this part is never easy, but he's very familiar, knows what to expect in terms of um, the change in mobility now that he's back on Earth. Commander of Crew 5, Nicole Mann also became the first uh, Native American woman to live on the International Space Station. So a real moment of pride there, I'm sure. And 
you can see her being helped uh, to those medical quarters. Again, all, all nominal, all uh, pre-planned checks, just an opportunity to make sure the crew is feeling good before they take that helicopter ride mm -hmm. back to shore. Exactly. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, all the crew members are uh, effectively placed on um, what basically looks like a, a stretcher. Um, and that's just, again, really to assist them because uh, returning to Earth after, uh, as we said before, 157 days in space um, can be pretty tough on the body. And of course, in order to keep them safe, we want to assist them. Um, so all four of the crew members are placed on um, a a wheelie bed <laughs> and uh, rolled back to those medical quarters, as you said, for their um, evaluations with the, uh, the flight doctors. So now our NASA astronauts are out of the spacecraft. We are awaiting egress of Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina, uh, her first space flight. And uh, as we mentioned, seasoned veteran Koichi Wakata of the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. And this looks like it may be Anna. Yeah, as I mentioned before, that slide, we have a great view of that slide now really helps the crew um, in this egress procedure. Oh, this is probably Koichi, uh, judging by, I can see that Japanese flag on that team member right there on the right. Yeah, I think you're right, because um, it looked like, yeah, that looks like Koichi. Um, it looks like they were, um, pulling from seat one. So yeah, that would have been Koichi's. Oh, I can see a Look smile at that on his smile. face. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not his first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> That means our last mission specialist and crew member to egress today will be Anna Kikina. In that far right seat, we can still see one of those SpaceX crew members inside helping her um, out of the seat restraints. Not even an hour since splashdown, and uh, we are almost having all four crew members out of the spacecraft. That's right. Splashdown occurred off the coast of Tampa, Florida at uh, 9.02 p.m. Eastern time. So, yeah, we're just shy of an hour. Again, we had great weather reports as we prepared to splash down at Tampa, and we even got pretty good views of how calm the, uh, the ocean appeared to be as the crew members awaited uh, the recovery ship to arrive. And for those that might be wondering, um, the at the top of the capsule there, we uh, there was a curved line. That was the line indicating where the nose cone um, was separated from the, the primary structure. So it looks like Ana Kikina uh, our cosmonaut on board crew five is about to make her way down the, the fun slide and egress <laughs> dragon endurance, which once again, it made its second splashdown. Chris Cosmos cosmonaut on Kikina, our final crew member to egress tonight. Again, her first space flight. She will also uh, have those same medical checks before flying back to Russia. Look at that smile as well. <laughs> uh, 
And that is all four of our crew members. Uh, now that Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna are safely back home on Earth and getting checked out by the medical teams, we're going to wrap up our live coverage of their return. Again, this all kicked off on October 5th, 2022. October 5 for Crew 5. <laughs> uh, from historic launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After successful liftoff and separation from Falcon 9, Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna made a 28-hour flight on board Dragon 2, the International Space Station. Since arriving at the space station, they spent nearly six months as members of Expedition 67 and 68, executing science experiments, spacewalks, and repairs while aboard the orbiting laboratory. <laughs> Their journey home began about 19 hours ago on March 10th when they closed the side hatch, closed the forward hatch to the Dragon capsule and undocked from the International Space Station at 11.20 p.m. Pacific time. After four successful departure burns and a phasing burn to line up their orbit, Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna rested for a few hours before waking up and to prepare for their re-entry. We jettisoned Dragon's trunk and performed our final on-orbit maneuver, the deorbit burn, at uh, 5.11 p.m. Pacific time to send the Dragon on its path home. The spacecraft re-entered Earth's atmosphere and slowed its descent with successful deployments of two drogue parachutes and four healthy mains, uh, with the final splashdown occurring off the coast of Florida at 6.02 p.m. Pacific time. Following that successful splashdown, we saw SpaceX recovery experts move in and prepare Dragon Endurance for its lift onto the recovery vessel. And just a little less than an hour ago, um, 58 minutes to be exact. Wow. <laughs> uh, following splashdown, we saw Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna make their way out of the Dragon capsule and into the recovery ship's medical facilities safe and sound. So next up, they will catch that helicopter flight back to shore. They will transfer to aircraft that will take them home. Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna will take a NASA plane for the short flight to Houston. And later, Anna will fly back to Russia. They will be reunited with families to bring an end to this mission. Of course, as always, it's been an honor and a privilege to share their journey with all of you as we continue this new era in human spaceflight. The return today marks the end of a direct handover uh, that we just executed after successfully launching the Crew-6 mission to the space station uh, uh, just a little over a week ago. Actually, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, about a week ago. Um, it has been an incredible honor and joy to share this mission with the public. All the teams from SpaceX and NASA continue to work hard to keep America leading the world in human spaceflight. Continue to follow SpaceX and NASA online and on social media for updates for the very latest on crew and cargo flights to and from the International Space Station. And we will continue to share the progress of Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna on social media as they travel back home. We also have a post-splashdown media telecon coming up at approximately 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time, where leadership from NASA, JAXA, and SpaceX will share updates as we conclude this successful mission. So we say thanks one more time for tuning in and cheering on Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna as they made their return back to Earth. So from all of us at NASA and SpaceX, welcome. Welcome home, Crew 5, and we'll see you next time. For generations, 